The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Detroit sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 204 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker, the show that actually gets it right and reveals the truth instead of just being honest with lazy opinions. Please share this podcast on all social media networks, and thanks very much. I'm Taylor Phillips, live from my basement apartment office in the northern outskirts of McBain, Michigan, and with me on Facebook Messenger Audio, as always from Georgia, is my co-host, Ed Smith. Thanks so much for, for being on here with me. Ed, how are you? Doing wonderful. I uh, just finished my shift a couple hours ago. Got the next day off. Ready for some uh, good old-fashioned R&R. Uh, but we still got some things to talk about today, here and now, uh, especially a particularly thrilling basketball contest uh, involving the Michigan Wolverines. But we'll get to that at a later time in this episode tonight. Yep, but first, um, we talk some Lions here. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! They made a lot of moves over the week. Over the week, uh, first off, they signed Marvin Jones on Tuesday to a five-year, forty million dollar contract from the Cincinnati Bengals. Then they added New England Patriots safety Tavon Wilson and signed him to a two-year deal. Then they re-signed Haloti Nana and Tahir Whitehead to two-year deals. Whitehead's contract worth eight plus million. And then they and then on uh, Wednesday they signed. Uh, uh, Thursday, rather, they signed sp- uh, safety or special team standout, whichever Johnson Batamosi from the Bengals, and re- uh, to a to a two year deal, and re signed backup quarterback Dan Orlovsky to a one year deal, I think, and signed defense ma- and signed defensive tackle Stefan Charles to a one year deal. Uh, Buffalo Bills now they're awarded a third and six a third and a sixth round. Comp- compensatory draft pick. They also retained cornerback Creston Butler and Don Mulback, the long, the long snapper. Uh, first off, uh, the the wide receiver uh, signing, Mar- Marvin Jones. They're trying to uh, fill in Calvin Johnson's shoes. Uh, not, uh, not sure if uh, that's going to be enough, Ed. Uh, can you break that down? Yeah, you know, it's just, it's easier said than done than saying, oh, we're going to, you know, fill the void of, of Calvin. There's only one Calvin Johnson that you're ever going to get. Um, so to say you could you could find someone who could be a good replacement, you know, that would be close to as equal as possible, uh, that's just, you know, uh, very difficult to accomplish. I mean, it's not like the situation that you had with the San Francisco 49ers that, yeah, you had Joe Montana and then waiting in the wings with Steve Young, okay, two back-to-back Hall of Famers. It, it's just not the case here in this situation. Now here's the thing. Now with Marvin Jones, he's six foot two, uh, has an arm length about thirty three over thirty three inches, has a good speed as indicated with his by his combine numbers, four point four six forty yard dash, um, at a vertical of thirty three inches, which is good, decent, especially for a guy who's over six foot tall. Um, like I said, it's not Calvin, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, it's in recent years though, his numbers um, he, he played in 2013, 2012, and 2013. Missed all of 2014 due to injury, but in 2015, all of his three seasons, by the way, uh, so far have been with the Bengals. Um, his numbers had increased, actually, in, both in terms of receptions, targets, and yards. Um, slight decrease in 2013 to 2015 in terms of yards per reception, uh, but, and, and as well as touchdowns, but um, he, he was seen upon as a dependable reaction in terms of uh, his receptions resulting in first downs, uh, nearly identical in 2015 as they were in 2013 as well. Um, so, I mean, and he almost he had 800 plus yards uh, in reception uh, last year with the Bengals. And it seems like the type, as, as some numbers will indicate, he seems to type as your go to, uh, I guess you say, one of your safety valves on third down um, because of his average yards per reception. Uh, was 12.6. In fact, all of his uh, average yards per reception so far and through his career has been over 10 yards, which, of course, what you would need to get, um, you know, on any type of third and long type of situation or close to it. So he seems to be showcasing um, a somewhat dep- 
dependable go to a receiver on third down. Now, that's what I'm guessing he'll be utilized for, because now with the wake of Calvin Johnson's retirement, I think this uh, shifts, this makes Golden Tate the new de facto number one receiver, the number one target per se. And Tate is a playmaker. He could run the routes, run the slot, also go deep, catch snag passes down the field. He has more than showed that on, on multiple cases. He can do uh, uh, unique things with his athleticism. So, on third downs, while it seems like, or whatever, certain key down situations where defenders may try to get someone to put double or even triple team coverage on tape, uh, they could leave room open possibly for a guy like Jones to sneak in, throw a route underneath, or what the case may be, snack a pass from Stafford and get enough yards for a first down. That's what I'm thinking uh, is the motivation behind this, um, part of the motivation behind this signing, and uh, besides the... Uh, needing to fill a void, a roster spot in the wake of Calvin Johnson's retirement. So those are my brief thoughts on that. Um, I think, you know, money, you know, when you look at it on base, five years, 40 mil, is, is he really worth all that much? Not necessarily, but hey, it's called you need to fill a, a spot here, fill a void. And, you know, Calvin is, you know, with Calvin's retirement, you are getting a lot of money taken out the cap space. So I guess they're just taking advantage of it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Marvin Jones, uh, I think, was the best uh, option the Lions could find at wide receiver to fill Calvin Johnson's cleats. Uh, yeah, because there wasn't necessarily, you know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, uh, a Debbie, uh, or Bevy rather, of, of depth out there in the free agency market for wide receivers. This wasn't like a loaded class, or even so necessarily coming up in the draft. So I think the Lions decided to take their chances there um, and just try the route, going with the route here with Marvin Jones. Yeah, and then they uh, signed safety Tavon Wilson to a two-year deal. Uh, the Lions were uh, almost running fresh out of safeties. They uh, had to try to uh, get get one of the best safeties uh, out there. Yeah, this was a, a move done because not only did they had just recently parted ways with James Ahedekbo, uh they also lost Issa Abu Kadus. Uh, he, he had gotten some time. Um, sometime late last year. Uh, now, Caduce has left the team. He has signed a new deal with the Miami Dolphins. So, you know, hey, he's, he's back there. He's down there with Sue now. So, good for him on that regard. But this was just a move done to so that roster. That's void. That void in space also. Yeah, I agree. Um, Haloti Nada, uh, the re signing of him to a two year deal. Uh, the, the Lions could not afford to lose uh, a, another defensive tackle. They uh, they they've they've already cleared up enough cap space to uh, sign the sign the free agents that they need. Uh, they also uh, re-signed uh, linebacker Tahir Whitehead. Uh, how, how valuable uh, to you uh, were, were the Lions re-signings? Of Donna and Whitehead. Well, they needed a yeah. Well, that was clearly evident because they can't be keep losing everybody. I mean, I understand reloading and re, and renewing, but it's it's you don't want to necessarily rebuild every single year with with, with teams with certain uh, lots of positions on your field. Okay, we already lost Sue. We already lost Fairly. And okay, we had to part ways with I, I hit it though and Stephen Tug. If you lost either or um, or and or both, uh, not a and Whitehead, it was like, okay, are we, what, are we in free fall here? Because I think, you know, was it offensively, this team's talented enough where under the right coaching and the right circumstances, they can try to make a playoff run. Uh, but with the defense, you know, they need to make, make some fixes and changes uh, to, get their def- to get their defense up to that level, close to that level as much as possible. So I don't know how they're going to be able to do all that with if you keep, you know, losing player, losing player, you know, possibly going the younger route. That type of thing. So it's good in the sense that, you know, it's it's not a total revamp, but you know that hey, they're still trying to be competitive in some spots, while not as competitive as others, And if you can make sense out of that. So defensively, I still expect them to hopefully just try to find their next young, uh, build their future defensive star, find it through the draft, work on them, get them to a polished product, you know, you can't expect them to be Sue because Sue is just once a once in a generation, once in a lifetime type of talent like Calvin. 
So if you can find one, if you can discover a gem here, uh, my hat will be off to you. But, uh, you know, it's just, just got to see how it where it goes. And then, of course, they re-signed backup quarterback Dan Orlovsky, who was, who was not used at all, or maybe not much, but uh, in the regular season. Little, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just mere, merely a depth move. And plus the familiarity, there's, there's a comfort level here. You know, I'm sure Dan likes playing in Detroit. He likes having Dan there. So it was a no, no problem thing, to, no problem move to make. And finally, uh, they signed another defensive tackle, Stephon Charles, from the Buffalo Bills to a one-year deal. Uh, so the Lions add another player to the defensive front. Any analysis Which on is, Stephon Charles? Mm, well, let's see. Stephon Charles, he was born in Canada. Um, it was one brief moment at this here, at this junction, waiting for the website to load up. Uh, like I said, Canadian born. He did play, um, he was eligible in the CFL, I think, yeah, he was he was a former CFL player, or rather he was drafted in the CFL, but he never played a down of football as to uh, um, he signed uh, as an undrafted free agent in the NFL, first with the Titans, didn't make the, uh, then he was signed to the Bills practice squad, um, and then during last season, uh, he appeared in 13 games for Buffalo, had one start. Uh, all in all, had 13 total tackles. Nine of those was by himself, and a sack and a fumble. So I guess you could say very, very limited sample size, um, yeah, sample numbers to go through what is worth, what his value is. Uh, but if they feel he can come in, have a breakout year, similar to what but they, Devin Taylor might have had, uh, maybe that's what they're banking on. He's still young. He's 27. Um, uh, if, if it's a way, like I said, to number one, not only at depth, possible, possibly trying to re-strengthen this defensive line as maybe what the goal that they're trying to, not just a here, uh, you would hope, but also possibly through the draft. Uh, but uh, I think that would be probably be my guess to their motivation behind this move today. Also, uh, one quick note, the Lions were going to host free agent defensive lineman Akeem Hicks, uh, a defensive lineman uh, wouldn't be bad either. Uh, so, uh, your thoughts on that? Team Hicks, didn't he play linebacker at UCLA? I believe so. I think that's the name. Uh, yeah, because I remember hearing that name. I think initially when he was the uh, was coming up with the draft that year, there were some talks. You know, some. Uh, draft boards having the Lions if they're in his right spot uh, taking him. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, was that the same year that they drafted Asa? Was it 2013? I, I think so. Look at Bleacher Report here. Now, is this Team Hicks? Uh, hold on. As in the linebacker? He was, he is a defensive line. Oh, defensive lineman. Okay, so like I said, uh, I'm thinking of somebody else. So what they're what they're like I said, it goes back to what I said before when they made the signing of, of Charles. They're just trying to repulsor that defensive line up there. So this is the their way of trying to add another player. Um, like I said, they're through here through the draft, uh, whatever the case may be. All right, looking into to Bleacher Report right now. On the Lions side here, Look, looking into Akeem Hicks, the defensive lineman, uh, by the way, the Dolphins are also going to, to host uh, ex-Lion Jason Jones, whom the, the Lions released a while ago. A tweet from Dave Burkett said, Akeem Hicks hasn't even Akeem Hicks hasn't even made his visit to the Bears yet because of travel hiccups. Gets in tonight, line's still on hold.
uh, Russell Okung to to visit both the both the Giants and Lions. Mm. Yeah, I just yeah I just found that out. I I recall. By the way, uh, before before we continue, uh, there was it wasn't Akeem. I was thinking of his name was Akeem Ayers. Uh, that's the guy I was thinking of. But he played linebacker uh, for the, for for UCLA. Like that, that's the guy who I was thinking about. But he was drafted in 2011 uh, by the Titans. So that must have been that. Well, yeah, that was the same year that the Lions drafted fairly. So. Yep. So uh, that that's another good idea. I wish, you, yeah, I wish you were, but unfortunately, Ayers is currently signed to a two-year contract with the St. Louis Rams. He signed that last year, so it's currently in the second year of that two-year deal. But Russell Kong is a very uh, inter- interesting name uh, to, to see. He's one of the best offensive linemen in the game. Uh, former All-American at college, made the Pro Bowl in 2012. Uh, still, um, you know, uh, will be a massive. Uh, in my view, upgrade for this offensive line. Uh, I guess we have to see one. Do they have the money? Would they have the money to afford him? And uh, you know, two. What what will be the potential uh, roster sacrifices to make this move happen? If and I'm, that's on the slim uh, possibility of if the Lions have a shot at getting Okung. Yeah, Okung. Yep. Russell Okung from the Seattle Seahawks. Um, I'm still I don't looking. Know why. I, just, I just like saying his name like that. <laughs> yep, I'm still looking for the uh, Akeem Hicks for for the Akeem Hicks article. I'm looking on DetroitLions.com now. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. Johnson Bonamosi is a special team standout. Uh, he's a cornerback as well. Yeah, one of those all-around athletes that you could use, have him on defense, but also return punts and kicks as well. Yep, I believe so. But um, you know, possibly be that uh, you know, yeah. Basically, a, a defensive Stephon Logan. Hopefully, he won't be kneeling on the five yard line ever taking a kickoff. Mm-hmm. I, I'm uh, googling. Um, I'm googling for the uh, Akeem Hicks uh, article here. There we go. This was according to Brad Big, Brad Biggs of the Chicago Tribune. He uh, used to play for the New England Patriots. Played 13 games for the Patriots last season after being traded from the Saints for tight end Michael Humanawanol. Humanawanol. He recorded 23 tackles and three sacks between the two teams in 2015. He was drafted in the third round out of Regina, Canada by the Saints and was one of seven players on 2015 opening day rosters that went to a Canadian school. He, he played both defensive end and defensive tackle in the NFL and most likely projects to be an interior, interior line player in Detroit. He would be reunited with former Saints def- defensive tackle Tyron Walker, who re-signed with the Lions on a one-year deal in early March. This by Mitch Sanderson of thescore.com. Profootballrumors.com also has is also reporting on that in an article of their own. It doesn't say anything about his uh, college history. Neither article says that. But anyway, it says here at debt.247sports.com, the Lions are working on a deal for Akeem Hicks. Uh, 
Uh, Jason Lakenfora of CBSSports.com tweets out, Jets working out a contract with defensive lineman Jarvis Jenkins. Lions work working to secure defensive line Akeem Hicks. Both deals likely to get done. So the Lions ha- are uh, not only expected to uh, get get Akeem Hinks inked up, but um, they're 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 already working on inking that contract. Yeah. And just this uh, being a lot to death, and I hopefully they're just uh, they're current they're evaluating uh, these potential signees as, as and uh, now current slash future roster members as best as they possibly could. Maybe that signing could come as early as tomorrow, perhaps. Maybe I mean it's being reported like this uh, by noted NFL dot com uh, writer and reporter. You now uh, it's. Let's believe unless something drastic happens, you know this this deal could very well be get, be gotten done uh, soon. That is correct. So uh, about the third and sixth round comp- compensatory draft picks, um, who do you predict the Lions to get in those draft picks? I don't know. Maybe they could uh, use one of those picks on a linebacker. And another one, I would guess, because for some reason they always use one of the late round draft picks on the, on, on the cornerback. So I'm guessing they'll follow the trend here and do the same here. And then, of course, they uh, retain Creston Butler and Don Mulback. Uh, not not very much. Not very. Neither of them very big, but. Um, that about covers Lions here. We will keep you posted on episode 205 on Spreaker. Meanwhile, Aubrey Dyer and I will uh, give you the uh, the post-game reactions uh, to the Wings and Pistons, meanwhile, on Blog Talk Radio. Moving on to the Tigers now. That one is long gone! Anibal Sanchez earlier was throwing in the bullpen. So uh, so he's uh, getting better in terms of his health. Tigers beat the Nationals 11-5 to in Lakeland. They were putting out a route early. And then they tied with the Philadelphia Phillies at 6 on Thursday. And then earlier on Friday, they lose to the Astros 10-4. to The pitching got roughed up. A home-and-home set against the Pirates coming up, first at home and then away Saturday and Sunday, and then they return to Lakeland Monday and Tuesday to play the New York Mets and the and the Atlanta Braves. I just got a Jeff Moss tweet here. So, um, moving on to the Red Wings now. The Red Wings uh, found themselves down 2 nothing after uh, Jeff Blaschel's comments following the 5-3 loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets. We didn't play as a... We didn't lose as a team. We lost as individuals. Uh, they found themselves down 2 nothing, as I just mentioned. Uh, their, their defense uh, fell asleep after uh, their, power, their sluggish power play failed two times to convert. And uh, Marco, what's his last name, got the first goal, and then uh, Tyler Myers got got the second goal. Nobody on defense uh, was stopping though was stopping those for Peter Morazic, but 
other than that, Peter Mrazek stood on his head, made uh, incredible saves when they needed him to. The Red Wings struck back with two goals in the second period, one from Dylan Larkin on a one-timer from Henrik Zetterberg into the slot from uh, behind the crease. And then Jonathan Erickson, of all people, getting his third goal of the season off off the pad of Michael Hutchinson and Potvin's left skate and into the net. Potvin mi- initially made a made a left pad save, but uh, the rebound bounced off Potvin's skate and into the net. So uh, credit Erickson with his third goal of the season from Cronwall and Helm. Justin Ablocator got got an assist on Larkin's goal along with Henrik Zetterberg. And then, and then in the third period, the Red Wings took the lead by taking advantage on a bad Jets turnover as uh, they, as Winnipeg tried to pass it around the back of the net. And uh, Tomas Tatar was right there, easily read it, picked it off, and uh, fed Justin Advocator a wide open centering pass in the slot. Advocator Easily beat Michael Hutchinson. Wings take advantage. They take the lead 3-2. to two. Aubrey Dyer on Twitter at the Punisher 1023 tweeted to me, the Jets are pretty much handing the Wings this game. Uh, the, the last few minutes, the Wings try to ha- hand it back to them, but uh, the Jets hit the crossbar. Uh, first, a tor- turnover by Quincy, creating another scoring chance, and then a few minutes later, the Jets hitting the post. Uh, then the Red Wings uh, got on the power play, but Henrik Zetterberg went to the box for a, a big, a big time slash. He tried not to get caught, but. Uh, it, it was too evident for for the referees not to catch. That that killed the Red Wings' chances to uh, seal the game. So the Jets uh, went to the power play after a four on four, a short four on four, and then the Jets pulled Hutchinson for the extra attacker, six on four. Zetterberg's, go- Zetterberg's penalty came in with less than two minutes to play. And the Red Wings suddenly, uh, man- the Red Wings uh, still managed to block their shots, and Mrazek made the saves, and, and the Red Wings held on to win 3-2, to two, which keeps, which uh, gave them two valuable points. They jumped ahead of the Penguins by one point with those two points to jump back into first place in the wild card standings as we go to the NHL.com. And see, the the Penguins just won. So they've jumped ahead of the Red Wings for first place in the wild card spot. The Red Wings with 77 points, 33-23-11. 20, 33-23-11. The Penguins 35, 24, and 8 with 78. The Red Wings host the Rangers next on Saturday. The the Pittsburgh Penguins go into Madison Square Garden and play the Rangers on Sunday. The Wings and Rangers game is Saturday at 2. But... uh, also creeping up the, are the Philadelphia Flyers with 75 points and the Hurricanes with 73. The New Jersey Devils still with 71. The Canadians and Senators are still in it with 70 points. Blue Jackets pretty much out of it with 64 points. They're a team that the Red Wings should have beaten uh, three days before this podcast. On a Tuesday night. The Red Wings choked that one away again. So 
So the Red Wings play the Rangers at 2 o'clock again. Going to DetroitRedWings.com and taking a look at what's also ahead on their schedule. They play Sunday night at 7.30 at the Joe on NBCSN against Mike Babcock's Toronto Maple Leafs. Hi, Babs. Hi, Babs. Yep. And then on Tuesday, they head to Philly and play the Flyers at 7.30 on FSD and NBCSN. That's a big, definite big game right there. A chance to uh, not only keep push distance away from the team that's chasing you, but again, get those crucial, valuable two points as we, you know, get closer and closer to the end of the regular season. The New York Rangers are in second place in the Metropolitan Division with 84 points, 39, 22, and 6. Maple Leafs, last place in the East, 55 points, 22, 33, and 11. Flyers, as I mentioned, 75 points, 32, 23, and 11. So uh, that about that about covers it for uh, for what's on tap. Then they go to Columbus again on Thursday at seven. Try and, to win that one, please. Yeah, get your revenge too. Then, then on then next Saturday they're, they're in Florida against the Panthers, and Tuesday they're in Tampa against the Lightning on the twenty second. Then they have a three game homestand heading into the end of this month. Canadians, Penguins, and Sabers, and then they they're in Montreal to wrap up the month of March. So that does it for the Red Wings. Moving on to the Pistons now. Left side line, three, and he answers. Pistons, uh, thanks to Reggie Jackson's uh, desperation three with under a minute to go, beat the Mavericks 102 and 102-96 on American Airlines Arena in Dallas on Wednesday night. Uh, uh, Aaron Baines only finished with one point and three rebounds. Zero field goal attempts because he can't rebound the uh, he couldn't rebound the the ball uh, consistently. And then on Friday, uh, the Pistons allow 69 points in Charlotte at Time Warner Cable Arena and lose to the Hornets 118 to 103. The defense appeared to be nowhere except in the third quarter. They held the Hornets to 19 points in the third quarter. Outscored them 28-19, but uh, that's about it. That's about all they did good as a team. Pistons uh, are still in are still in eighth place in in the Eastern Conference at 33 and 32. The Bulls lost again. 30. They're now at 32 and 32. Hornets improved to 36 and 28 in fifth place, just a half, just uh, a game and a half behind the Miami Heat at 38 and 27 in fourth place. Pistons' next game, Pistons' next games are in Philadelphia and Washington. 76ers are nine and 56, officially eliminated from playoff contention, as I mentioned. Last Thursday night on Blog Talk Radio with Aubrey Dyer, and then uh, the hey, Wizards. Let's be honest. Let's be, yep. let's be honest. The Sixers were eliminated from contention when the season started. Yep. Then the Washington Wizards, as I was just mentioning, are thirty and thirty-four in tenth place in the East, sixteen games back, two and a half back of the Pistons for eighth place. Wizards are uh, still uh, trying to get back into it. They got uh, John Wall out there. Uh, another another uh, another important game for the Pistons to uh, 
to win. But uh, first, they uh, need to route the 76ers like they did la- in their last meeting at the Palace. Just just beat them. Don't let this be a game where if if you stick around long enough, it can come back to haunt you. I mean, look look what happened when we faced the Knicks. Okay, right now the Knicks are currently getting destroyed by, 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 the, by the Clippers. So that's a team you should have beaten. And right now that's a game that's hanging over your head because... You know, you're you're battling for your lives here for this eighth playoff spot. Really, you should be contending for seven or even six, but you're lose, but losing games to bad teams like the Knicks. You know, it's it's costing you games, costing you spots here. So, this is a game where you need to handle your business. All right, there was a you know a very poor effort um, defensively for sure. Um, Andre Drummond was not there. to was virtually non-existent. Yeah, he had nine rebounds, but uh, only had five points, so no double-double for Andre. Um, Reggie Jackson and Tobias Harris continued their consistent stro- uh, scoring. Contavious Caldwell Pelt finally showed a pulse. I mean, after that debacle against the Spurs, you know, he showcased uh, some semblance of life here. He had 24 points. He was high scoring Piston all night, but there just wasn't enough because, again, like when he even when it got close, the defense just couldn't you know make enough stops, uh, crucial stops to get things set up to where Detroit could have either tied it or taken the lead. So another that's that's one thing they're gonna have to definitely work on. Try to tighten up as much as possible as we get closer and closer to the end. If they even make the playoffs, if they're expected to have a competitive series, their defense must be way better than what it is right now. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So, with all the uh, Pistons material out of the way, we're going to move on, move on to uh, college basketball. For three, yes, sir! How about that Cameron Chapman buzzer beater with, with uh, two-tenths of a second left, giving Michigan the Wolverines with the, uh, the, the Wolverines the 72-69 win over the one-seeded Indiana Hoosiers, the Wolverines came in eight-seeded, and they kept coming back. Indiana kept pulling away a little bit, but 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 Michigan kept coming back. And uh, now, was, in the final seconds, Michigan had a chance to win it with a hoop, and the, and they got a three. It was an absolute back and forth wild affair, way different than the uh, massacre that we saw a few weeks back at Chrysler Center where literally the game turned and ended on a 28 nothing run uh, from the Hoosiers, and they never looked back after that. So don't think that wasn't in the Wolverines' minds a little bit uh, when they uh, had this meetup today. It was a tight game played throughout. Uh, it was multiple ties and lead changes. Really, the only thing that was uh, the most the biggest, you know, I guess you say breakaway run, was even was surprisingly enough from Michigan. At some point in the second half, they went on a 9 nothing run, of course, that quickly evaporated um, because not only Indiana did a great job of constantly, and I mean constantly, getting to the free throw line. That was it. That's how they were able to pad their lead a little bit. Um, Seventeen, yeah, they were seventeen to twenty-one from from their with their free throws. Whereas conversely, uh, Michigan, even though you know they had a few more attempts than Michigan, but Michigan, as you can see here. Much, much more accurate. They only missed they had 16 attempts, only missed two. Uh, so that, that was one reason that they were, they were able to stay in this game. Slightly better three-point uh, free-throw shooting. And um, another key, key factor here, turnovers. Michigan, I believe, had 22 points or outscored uh, uh, the, uh, the Hoosiers in the, turno- in the points off turnovers department. I believe they have 22 or so, compared to like 13 or 14 for Indiana. Even though, you know, Indiana dominated the rebound game in the fast break game, which was expected. Michigan's, they're not a fast team, and they're not a big team. They are what they are. They are a shooting team. Uh, but this was expected. What wasn't expected was the turnovers. And, of course, that paid uh, huge dividends in the end. Indiana had a chance. The game was tied uh, to possibly, you know, score a go-ahead basket, drive it to the hoop, boom, turnover, uh, into the hands of Chapman, and... You know, I liked the idea, you know, watching on the replay, it was very smart. You know, obviously hindsight, yeah, it was smart to not get the timeout because, one, there was still plenty of time left. 
and you weren't, you know, it wasn't like a rush situation. Oh, my goodness, nine seconds left, you got the rebound, rush out to the point. No, you had time to get the ball up the floor, uh, set up your perimeter, set up your scheme, and then just let your point guard do what he had to do. And that's exactly what Walton did. Um, horrendous stay offensively, over three, zero, you know, with only two points. So those two come from the free throw line, but still, 12 assists, two steals. Those, and put a big circle on those 12 assists, especially that last one, because what? It set up the game winning shot. Um, now, as for Chapman, he, uh, he, had, well, he had made seven threes, I believe, this whole entire year coming into today's game. Uh, and we'll wind Just up seven the entire point. season? Seven. Seven oh made three point shots. I know. And it was even crazier. As soon as he got the ball, even he even said himself. There was a slight hesitation uh, because he, which gave ample time for the Indiana defender to get in his grill a little bit. Cool, man. That shot, and Chapman just got the ball off, and that ball, my goodness, it, it went straight through the net. The reaction was insane. Uh, initially, we thought that was the end of the game right there, but at the review, there was still some time left on the clock, but just wasn't going to be enough for, any, for Indiana to you know, get a catch-and-shoot, pull a Derek Fisher, basically. Uh, try to tie this game back up with a, with a literal last second three of their own. So, great win, big win, team effort shown throughout. Um, I dare say it, this Michigan team has been playing their best basketball as of late, and they picked the right and ample time to do so. And, and they earned that win with, with that Chapman three, which uh, made the, uh, the bench and the Michigan faithful explode. <laughs> So Michigan will take on Purdue Saturday at 1 on CBS in the Big Ten semifinal. Uh, Purdue just outlasted Illinois. Last, last time they were, they were up by almost 40 points. And they just cruised to a victory. So uh, Purdue's going to have to... Uh, so Michigan's going to have to st- step it up more against Purdue because... Uh, Purdue is uh, has has outplayed Indiana uh, on Friday in in the quarterfinals. The way uh, Indiana lost that game, and and the way Purdue won their game. Well, it's going to come down to um, try to you know try to recapture a little bit what you had here. You know, you know what you're going to get from Michigan. They're not a rebounding team. They're not a streak-up-the-floor team. They're a patient team that likes to set up their shooters and try to get high-quality open looks from the perimeter and from three-point range. Use that. Use Derek Walton. Use ball handling ability. Uh, dribble, dribble, uh, and just drive through the hoop and hopefully well, set up some, some open guys. You know, whether they Muhammad, Muhammad Ali Abdul-Rahman, Aubrey Dawkins, Duncan Robinson, of course, today's hero, uh, uh, Chapman. Um, whereas conversely, you know, so, saw what you saw here. Limit the turnovers. In fact, try to win the turnover battle as much as you possibly can because what it led to you um, winning this game. So if you try to uh, have similar success, success here, you could be very well in this game. Now, there's, there's other intangibles to look out. There's X factors. What random player is going to go off, have a hot streak, or hit an unlikely shot? We saw that happen today. Will the refs favor this team or this and that? So it's just going to come down to basics and intangibles in that one. The Purdue should be favored to win this game, and I doubt. And I'm, part of me thinks they will. But uh, if, if Michigan does give a, uh, I guess you could say, a passionate effort, uh, hopefully it will be enough to leave some mind in the uh, – leave some weight, rather, in the mind of the committee members of the selection uh, for the tournament. Cameron Chapman only finished with five points. Just five. There's another surprising note. Three of those five points actually won it for the Wolverines, while uh, Duncan Robinson and Mark Donnell finished with with 12 points each. Zach Irvin led with 17 Abdul Rockman with 15, Moritz, uh, uh, Moritz Wagner with 9. Another interesting uh, uh, footnote here. The last two minutes or so, I believe, in that game, um, starting with two minutes left, 
Michigan trailed Indiana by five, 66-61. As the final score indicates, they went on an 11-3 run. Very impressive, not just offensively, but defensively, uh, to buckle down in crunch time, get the stops, get the turnovers, and preserve this victory. Very underrated uh, uh, stat here, in my opinion, in the midst of all the uh, hysteria of that last shot by Chapman. That capped off an 11-3 to run that won the game. The mightily impressive by this young team. Now, uh, moving on to the Michigan State Spartans. Valentine for the win! Yeah! They routed the Ohio State Buckeyes again, 81-54. Uh, I, I know uh, Thad Mata is a great coach. It, it, it's just the roster; it's like pretty flawed. Ohio State's a better basketball team than usually a better basketball team than that, but uh, this year just wasn't their year. Uh, too much Spartans in that game. It, yeah. Denzel Valentine yeah. had 19 points. Aaron Harris, 13. It was all Michigan State. Yeah, just a conceived, uh, or, or rather, uh, concerted effort, teamwork all around. Four of Michigan State's five stars got into double digits. Only one of Ohio State's five starters accomplished that. Um, you know, Denzel Valentine, of course, leading the way. If it wasn't for his uh, injuries from earlier, you could probably say he was possibly uh, more than likely to be a front runner uh, for the Wooden Award. But you know, who knows? Maybe he is now, especially with the recent news that Ben Saunders will not be uh, eligible to. I guess you could say uh, slight academic issues, which is a little bit crazy considering the way he's performed. He is uh, hands down been the best performer all year. But that's another topic for another day. Um, if it goes to Valentine, good for him. Not trying to hate, not trying to discredit. Um, so as for Michigan State, just business as usual. Uh, nice way for them to rest up until the uh, uh, the semifinal game. Um, because, again, they already know pretty much well-handedly they're going to be a high seed in the upcoming tournament. The question is, will they be a three? Will they be a one? That's to that, that aspect remains to be seen. Whereas Ohio State, they kind of needed a big win like today, like what Michigan had gotten done. Uh, to state their case uh, to keep uh, to get themselves a spot in those that field of sixty eight, but I think this loss today and the way that they performed, it uh, it bursted their bubble, liter- figuratively and literally. And speaking of the semifinal game, Michigan State takes on two seeded Maryland. That should be a really good one. Three thirty on CBS on Saturday. Uh, that sh- that should be a fun one. Actually, I expect that to be. Uh, Highly close competitive contest. Um, it'd be interesting to see because I believe isn't Maryland did Michigan State sweep that series against Maryland? I believe so. Yes. Uh, and Michigan did they beat Maryland? I know they beat them once, but did they beat Maryland twice? Let uh, me look at. Uh, let me look it up here. They split the series. Okay, it was a split series. Yeah, uh, they yeah. they upset but Maryland both, at Chrysler both Center, games and were then close. yeah, yeah, both games were close. Then they then they lost at Maryland in a close one. Yeah, yeah, they fought hard, uh, but Michigan's uh, playing Purdue instead. Uh, I I think uh, uh, did did they did uh, Michigan split the series with Purdue or did did they uh, get swept? Uh, they I they lost at Purdue. That's what I remember. Yeah, they, they got trucked uh, at, at Purdue. They came back and won the home game, sixty-one fifty-six. So yeah, they split That's the right, season. Yep. The series against Purdue. Yeah, that yeah that home game was a close one. So uh, yeah. both team, both team, both Michigan's, both Michigan and Michigan State split their uh, split their season regular season series against uh, their upcoming opponents, the Boilermakers and the Terrapins. Uh, speaking of the Terrapins, they uh, just just had to hold on to beat. The Nebraska Cornhuskers, ninety-seven to eighty-six, in the in the uh, the fourth and final quarterfinal game of the Big Ten Men's Basketball Championship Tournament. But um, I would predict Michigan State to win by a close one. 
even though Maryland is two seated. Because uh, Maryland gave MSU uh, quite a fight. Yeah, I accidentally hung up on you because my nose was too close to the phone. Because uh, uh, schnoz you have there, then. Yeah. A- yeah. Anyway, uh, Mar- Maryland uh, again beat Nebraska in ninety-seven, eighty-six. Uh, State uh, swept the home and home series actually, so both teams didn't split their season series uh, uh, with the, their upcoming opponents. State swept the Terrapins. Michigan split the home and home series against uh, split the uh, season series with bo- with the Boils. Uh, but anyway, MSU and Maryland, uh, Maryland. Uh, Gave MSU a battle when uh, Michigan State was trying to uh, snap their their four game losing streak. When the uh, Big Ten regular the Big Ten conference season was underway in in January, Spartans uh, finally got their first uh, Big Ten win. It was against the Maryland Terrapins at Breslin Center, and then they. Uh, then they beat the Maryland Terrapins again on the road because the Spartans were improving. In some ways, you could say that first one against Maryland was the turning point that Michigan State needed to turn their season around. Now look where they are. You couldn't argue that they'll all be traced back to that first game against against the Terps in January. I, I believe so. And now comes the part where we ask five questions. Let him rip, Taylor. It's time for five questions with Taylor the Gator Phillips. Question number one. Do all the free agent moves the Lions made matter at all? Uh, I think it matters in some sense. Again, they're, they're trying to fill out uh, fill out. Rep- Fill out spaces that's been left void in some of the recent roster departures. But I think that just about covers it. I, don't, I didn't see anything, you know, major or earth shattering with some of the signees they, that they did. To use a, a similar sense, it's not like the Tigers losing Victor Martinez and going out and signing Prince Fielder. It wasn't that type of thing. Nowhere near that type of stratosphere. But, uh, you know, it was just, just uh, you know, a day the business type of mill type of deal to me. Yeah, think about uh, how much it matters to uh, Lions fans if the Fords own them as well. Oh, oh God. Yeah, that. Yeah, we got that, too. So anyway, question number two. Next question. Are the Red Wings trying to make senseless history with their playoff streak? Well, I don't see it as senseless history too much. I do think it, it is, it, like I mentioned before, it's just a dumb crutch that fans use nowadays to uh, try to substantiate any type, any type of uh, yep. defensive stance for, for Ken Holland. But, um, you know, if you're a team and you have good enough players on your squad and you feel you should be one of those teams contending for a playoff spot, which I do think, obviously, the Red Wings, we've discussed before, they have young talent on this team. Uh, that need the experiences, the spotlight of playoff games to help get themselves better, which in turn will get the team, make the team better in future years. So if they see a chance where, hey, let's try to get, you know, or at least for the sake of the development of our young guys, let's get into the playoffs, I got no problem with that. I really don't. Right, but um, it, if, uh, if the Red Wings are making the playoffs just to make the playoffs and, and not not contend, it it wouldn't make much sense if the Red Wings make the playoff just made the playoffs at all if they're not not a contender because the, they're they're going to keep on losing in the first round unless uh, they they e- either get better or or m- miss the playoffs. They got to do one of the two just to, yeah. just to wake way, wake up the fans. I do agree. I do agree. And either way, a change has to be made at that point here uh, because I don't want to. 
fall to another low where it comes, oh my God, here it is. It'll be, oh wow. And then all of a sudden, it'll be 15 or 20 years since you last won the cup. Let's not go through another 40 year uh, drought like we did uh, until 97, okay? So I definitely am in agreement with you on that. Uh, but I think if Morazic is closer to the Morazic that we saw in, in January, um, and you see your young guys like Larkin, um, amongst others, to uh, go out and help you win, well, win you some games. Well, of course, the occasional veteran leadership, Richard, Statsuk, Zetterberg, you know, depending on the matchup, because that's another key thing, too. Matchups help uh, dictate your fate. You have the right matchup, you could actually possibly win your series. I thought they, they damn sure had a good shot um, not you know, against, uh, against the Lightning. Unfortunately, they choked it themselves, but still, they had a good shot. So again, it all depends on those factors. Goaltending. Um, defense. Defense. Definitely defense. Can your young stars rise up and match up placement? One quick note. Uh, Jeff Blashill continues to make wrong decisions. He he continues to not put Dylan Larkin or Andres Athanasiu on the power play. He's never. It's as if he's never done that before. When uh, Richard Zetterberg and, and Ablocator and Nyquist and, and others have not clicked on the power play, it, it is still ranked 22nd in the NHL. I, I think that uh, giving Larkin and Athena a power, uh, on the power play a try would, wouldn't hurt at all because uh, Athena Seo and Larkin can, can actually produce. Larkin's been one been one of your best productive uh, players all year, and uh, I thought I see you once he when he gets more time has shown his usefulness as well. So it's not rocket science, right? Just put him on the same damn line, put him on the same damn unit here. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, put him on the power play too. But um, that's on Blashell to give it give him more ice time and put him on the power play simultaneously because uh, Athanasiu is actually more of a thriving Sarkin than than Jeff Blaschel can ever imagine. Because Blaschel has uh, coached Athanasiu before, Athanasiu, and and uh, Athanasiu was uh, incredible for the Grand Rapids Griffins. So Blaschel should know, should know firsthand how good this guy is. So why the hell is he not playing him? Is he under advice or uh, upper-handed uh, brainwashing from Holland? That's the only explanation I could fathom. Maybe he's using the washed-up veterans too too many times when uh, they almost don't have it anymore. Just like uh, Henrik Zetterberg, Jonathan Erickson, Nick Cronwall. I mean, I mean, Nick Cronwall's a, a, a disease more more so than Jonathan Erickson. Yeah, but at this point with those contracts, who the hell else? Whatever team is is going to even want to be within ten feet ten feet of them? So right. I, I, I doubt we. You know, unfortunately, we're stuck with them. As dreadful as that sounds, right? Uh, every right, every everyone should know that by now. Uh, I I would give uh, Cronwall and Erickson less ice time if it, if I were to keep them. If I were the GM, if I were the head coach, I would pr- I would put. Uh, Smith and DeKaiser on the first line, Cronwall and and uh, Quincy on the second line, uh, on the third line rather, Erickson and and uh, Cronwall and Green on the third line, Eric Erickson and Quincy on the second li- on the second pairing. S- so, with all that out of the way, question number three. Next question. Do the Pistons need Stanley Johnson, Anthony Tolliver, Jody Meeks, and Spencer Dinwiddie back from injuries really soon? Um, I would say yes, uh, definitely in the cases of at least for two, and that would be, of course, Tolliver and Johnson. Now, we did hear news from Stan Van Gundy that uh, uh, they should be ready to go in the next couple, next few days, maybe, you know, as soon as the next game. Uh, that's a wait and see, but uh, it's definite that they need them, especially, you know, uh, in terms of getting familiarity uh, back with your minutes, spreading, spreading, spreading it amongst your starters and whatnot, um, Stanley Johnson's defense, as I noted, you know, quite impressive with his age and with his re- with his wingspan. So that would help matters also. Um, Tauber has, has once in a while shown a good uh, pick and pop shoot 
uh, from the perimeter, that would be needed as well. So those, yes, absolutely, dude, they need them back. At least those two players, those two guys, they need back soon. Because I don't see Jody Meeks returning because he's been, you know, he's been hurt for most of the year anyway, you know, when we're, we're still done fine enough. It'll be a nice added bus, uh, plus a good bonus, but uh, the focus is just hopefully uh, Tolliver and Johnson come back very soon. I believe so. Next question. Question number four, how much momentum does the upset win over the Indiana Hoosiers give the Michigan Wolverines heading into the semifinals? Big. Um, it's definitely a motivator as, as you could, as you could have one, because they didn't just beat some fluky number one seed. This was the undisputed outright Big Ten regular season champions. And you can make an argument, had not been for a horrid stretch, that 28 no run, um, back in back in, back at Chrysler Center when they first played them, they could have swept this series, honestly, um, because the other the other game they played uh, was a close was was as close as you possibly get, um, and they just uh, you know they made their plays matter when it needed to at, at the most crucial and opportune times. Great, their defense showed up for once, getting those turnovers. Um, that they just played motivated ball and. This will even get help them get even more motivation, as I'm sure they'll face another opponent that people was already already counting them out, counting them out against. I mean, the Wolverines, if ESPN is is currently projecting uh, other odds makers rather, they have an eight percent chance of winning this tournament. If John Beeline takes a photo of that, places it on the on the whiteboard tomorrow, I'd be more than happy to see this team come out there and try to prove those doubters wrong. Next question. Question number five, do the Wolverines need to win the Big Ten tournament to be in the NCAA tournament? Because I heard from Ryan Schilling on the Schilling Report on the Team 92.1 FM WQTX in Lansing uh, that uh, if Michigan were to beat Purdue, then they then they still wouldn't make it to the NCAA tournament. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't help them much. So, uh, which, it, which I think would be, yeah. which would be incredibly unfair and just absolutely BS because I think, you know, They've won enough games in the regular season. I think you could kind of make a vouch, even though I don't want to say an excuse, but you could kind of vouch for that, that, listen, for the most of the season, they didn't have their best player in Karis LeVert. So that's one argument you can make. And, oh, by the way, they just beat the outright regular season champions, the number one seed in the tournament. Now, I get it. You know, two of those, two of their last three wins came against Northwestern. Northwestern is terrible. At their second one, they had to stave off overtime. But a win is a win, and in March, what's the term? Survive in advance. The Wolverines have done that and spades and then some. So if to me, if you beat Purdue, you're in. I still say, yes, you still have work to do. Probably close to a bubble as you can get. I think the bubble would have popped today if you lost against Indiana. Definitely would have popped if you lost against Northwestern. But if you get a win, somehow, some way, you beat uh, Purdue, I would say your chances. Uh, just skyrocketed. Uh, even in, and how about this? You beat Purdue, and you have a close but competitive game, but you lose on Sunday. I think you more than warranted a uh, spot in the tournament. But if if you want to cover all bases, leave no doubt, then you you would have to go pretty much do the unthinkable, which would possibly include beating Michigan State in the tournament final. So uh, a tall task for sure, because depending on who you face. Uh, and who you got to go through, the combination of Purdue, Maryland, and or the Spartans. Um, it's it's a daunting one, but hey, sometimes to get to the promised land, you got through the darkest of tales here. So this is what the spot the Wolverines find themselves in right now. And, uh, you know, they just got to push on through it with as a great team effort as possible. And hopefully with the right coaching, what John Beeline has done, you can help lead them in the right direction. Yeah, it's going to be a close tournament. I I believe uh, Michigan State will win the Big Ten tournament, though. Uh, they're going to have uh, two uh, upcom- two hard upcoming uh, battles on their hands upcoming as well. But uh, I, I I just think the Michigan State Spartans will uh, capture the Big Ten tournament championship this se- this this year. 
Now, if you're Michigan, you would kind of hope for Maryland to win because I think I think you have a much better chance beating Maryland than Michigan State. Right. Michigan State, they they have Michigan scheme figured out to a T. We saw what they did on the Chrysler Center on Super Saturday. It was embarrassing. Uh, well, maybe Michigan used that as yeah. what to learn, what what to do, what not to do, but I, I would rather take my chance, especially when we've seen in two other games, this two closer games this season, competitive games, I would rather take my chances with Maryland than the Spartans. Because if you get beat and beat handedly, that might have, uh, and that would be the last thing that the committee sees before they make this decision. You know, you, you don't want to take any chances. I'd rather have a competitive loss and, you know, and right, right, roll the dice and just get completely killed and blown out and, and have my fate essentially sealed right there. Yeah, I would agree. If I were if I were a Michigan fan, I would root for Maryland to beat to upset Michigan to uh, not upset Michigan State, but in terms of seed why in terms of seeds, but but to beat Michigan State two against three, two seed against three seed. So uh, for all the listeners and fans out there, if you want to answer those questions, just just replay the episode and answer them in the comment bank below this episode. Also, please share all over the place. Share, 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 share on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Pinterest, everywhere on social media. Just keep Even on sharing. Tumblr. What? Even Tumblr. Tumblr, yes. Kidding. Almost almost forgot about that. Thank you very much. Just, just keep on sharing as many times as you can. That episode... So that wraps up episode 204 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker. Ed, thanks so much again for your help. I'll talk to you Tuesday at 1230 for episode 205 on Spreaker. My pleasure, Taylor. Already looking forward to it. Take care, my friend. Yep, thanks. And for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. If there's anything you fans want, want more or less of on our podcast, please let us know. We'll talk to you on Spreaker Tuesday at 1230 for episode 205. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Bye, Mr. T.